Chapter Seventeen of Idiala. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Idiala, by Sarah Grand. Chapter Seventeen. To give the story continuity, it will be necessary to piece the events together as they followed. Many of them only came to my knowledge some time after they occurred, and even then I was left to surmise a good deal. But I am able now, with the help of papers that have lately come into my possession, to verify most of my conjectures and arrange the details. The summer weather had begun now. Laburnums and lilacs were in full flower, the air was sweet with scent and song, and to one who had borne the heavy winter with a heavy heart, but was able at last to lay down a load of care, the transition must have been like a sudden change from painful sickness to perfect health. Idiala went to the great hospital at once. She had written to fix a day, and Lorimer was waiting for her. She was not taken to his room, however, as on the previous occasion, but to another part of the building, a long gallery hung with pictures, where she found him superintending the arrangement of some precious things in cabinets. Idiala looked better and younger that day in her summer dress than she had done in her heavy winter wraps on the occasion of their first meeting. But when she found herself face to face with Lorimer, she began to tremble and was overcome with nervousness in a way that was new to her. He saw the change in her appearance and manner at a glance, and, smiling slightly, begged her to follow him, and led the way through long passages and many doors, passing numbers of people, to his own room. He spoke to her once or twice on the way, but she was only able to answer confusedly, in a voice that was rendered strident by the great effort she had to make to control it. He busied himself with some papers for a few minutes when they reached his room, to give her time to recover herself. And then he said, standing with his back to the fireplace, looking down at her, and speaking in a tone that was even more musical and caressing than she remembered it, "'Well, and how are you?' And how has it been with you since your return? I am utterly shaken and unnerved, as you see, she answered, then added passionately, I cannot bear my life. It is too hateful. There is no need to bear it, he said. Nothing is easier than to get a separation after what has occurred. Was there any witness? No, and I don't think anyone in the house suspects that there is anything wrong. And none of my friends know. I have never told them. I wonder why I told you. You wanted me to help you, he suggested. I don't think I did, she said. How could I want you to help me when I don't mean to do anything? I fancy I told you because I was afraid you would think me a little mad that day and I would rather you know the truth than think me mad. I don't mean to try for a separation. I can't leave him entirely to his own devices. If I did, he would certainly go from bad to worse. And if you don't, what will become of you? I think much more of such a life would make you reckless. She was silent for a little. Then she exclaimed, Help me not to grow reckless. I am so alone. He took her hands and looked down into her eyes. A sudden deep flush spread over his face, smoothing out all the lines, as she had seen it do once before, and transforming him. It is like walking on the edge of a precipice in the dark, he said in a low voice and his grasp tightened as he spoke. There was something mesmeric in his touch that overpowered Idiala. She felt a change in herself at the moment, and she was never the same woman again. 
I will help you, if I can, he said after another pause. And then he let her go. After that they talked for some time. He tried to persuade her to reconsider her decision and leave her husband. He honestly believed it was the best thing she could do, and told her why he thought so. She acknowledged the wisdom of his advice, but declined to follow it. And he was somewhat puzzled, for the reason she gave were hardly enough to account for her determination. They wandered away from that subject at last, however, and talked of many other things. He told Idiala of his first coming to the great hospital as a patient, and gave her some of the details of his own case and told her enough of his private history to arouse her sympathy and interest. But of the nature of these confidences, I know nothing. Iriala felt in honor bound not to repeat them, as they were made to her in the course of a private conversation, and she was always scrupulously faithful to all such trusts. I know, however, that he was a man who had suffered acutely, both from unhappy circumstances and from those troubles of the mind which beset clever men at the outset of their career, and sometimes never leave them entirely at peace. But this man was something more than a clever man. He was a man in a thousand. He had, in a strong degree, all that is worst and best in a man. The highest and most spiritual aspirations warred in him with the most carnal impulses, and he spent his days in fighting to attain to the one and subdue the other. Idiala had never known a man like this man. His talents, his rapid changes of mood, as sense or conscience got the upper hand, and his versatility charmed her imagination and excited her interest. And he had, besides, that magnetic power over her, which it is given to some men to compel people of certain temperaments to their will. While she was with him, he could have made her believe that black was white, and not only believe it, but be glad to think that it was so. And he always compelled her to say exactly what she had in her mind at the moment, even when it was something that she would very much rather not have said. But I am forgetting my other object in coming, Idiala broke off at last. May I look at the books? Lorimer took out his watch. You ought to have some lunch first, he said. If you will come now and have some, we can return and look at the books afterwards. Idiala acquiesced, fearing it was his own lunchtime, and knowing it would detain him if she did not accompany him. Ladies not being allowed to lunch at the great hospital, they went, as before, to the station close by, and sat down side by side, perfectly happy together, chatting, laughing, talking about their childhood, and making those trifling confidences which go so far to promote intimacy, and are often the very first evidence of affection. Now and then they touched on graver matters. He upheld all that was old, and believed we can have no better institutions in the future than those which have already existed in the past. Idiala had begun to think differently. I am sure it is a mistake to be forever looking back to the past for precedence, she said. The past has its charms, of course. But it is the charm of the charnel house. It is the dead past, and what was good for one age is bad for another. As one man's meat is another man's poison, he said. Proverbs prove nothing, she answered lightly. Have you noticed that they go in pairs? There is always one for each side of an argument. One man's meat as another man's poison is met by what is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, and so on. But don't you think it absurd to cling to old customs that are dying a natural death? Learn of the past if you like, but live in the present and make your laws to meet its needs. It is this eternal waiting on the past to copy it, rather than to be warned by its failures, to do as it did under the impression, apparently, 
that we must succeed better than it did, following in its footsteps, though we know they led to ruin once, and because the way was pleasant, being surprised to find that it must end again in disaster. It is this abandonment of all hope of finding new and efficacious remedies for the old diseases of society that has checked our progress for hundreds of years, and we will keep the world in some respects just as it was at the time of crucifixion. For my own part, I cannot see that history does repeat itself, except in trifling details, and in the lives of unimportant individuals. I think, he rejoined, if you have studied the decline of the Roman Empire, you must have seen a striking analogy between that and our own history at the present time. With the exception of changes of manners, which only affect the surface of society, we are in much the same state now as the Romans were then. I know many people say so and believe it, Idiala answered, and there is evidence enough to prove it to people who are trying to arrive at a foregone conclusion. But it is not the resemblances we should look to, but the differences. It is in them that our hope lies, and they seem to me to be essential. Take the one grand difference that has been made by the teaching for hundreds of years of the perfect morality of the Christian religion. Do you think it is possible for men, while they cling to it, to reel back into the beast and be no more? But are men clinging to it? Yes, in a way, for it has insensibly become a part of all of us and has made it possible for us to show whole communities of moral philosophers now in a generation. The ancients had only an occasional one in a century. But such a one. The old moral philosophers were grand, certainly, but not grander than our own men are, of whom we only hear less because there are so many more of them. But do you mean to say society is less sinful than it was? There is one section of society at the present day, they tell me, which is most desperately wicked. It is worse than any class was when the world was young, because it knows so much better. But I believe the bulk of people like right so well that they only want a strong impulse to make them follow it. I feel sure sometimes that we are all living on the brink of a great change for the better, and that there is only one thing wanting now a great calamity, or a great teacher, to startle us out of our apathy and set us to work. We are not bold enough. We should try more experiments. They can but fail, and if they do, we should still have learnt something from them. But I do not think we shall fail forever. What we want is somewhere, and must be found eventually. They tried some experiments with the marriage laws in France once, Lorimer observed tentatively. Yes, and failed contemptibly because their motive was contemptible. They did not want to improve society, but to make self-indulgence possible without shame. I think our own marriage laws might be improved. People are trying to improve them, he said with a slight laugh. A friend of mine has just married a girl who objected to take the oath of obedience. How absurd it is for a girl of nineteen to imagine she knows better than all the ages. I think, said Idiala, that it is more absurd for all the ages to subscribe to an oath which something stronger than themselves makes it impossible for half of them to keep. Strength of character must decide the question of place in a household as it does elsewhere and it is surely folly to require, and useless to insist on, the submission of the strong to the weak. The marriage oath is farcical. A woman is made to swear to love a man who will probably prove unlovable, to honor a man who is likely as not to be undeserving of honor, and to obey a man who may be incapable of judging what is best either for himself or her. I have no respect for the ages that uphold such nonsense. There was never any need to bind us with an oath. If men were all they ought to be, wouldn't we obey them gladly? To be able to do so is all we ask. Well, that is a difficult question, he answered. 
and I don't think we need trouble ourselves about it anyway. Do you like flowers? Yes, she burst out in another tone. And easy chairs, and pictures, and china, and everything that is beautiful, and all sensual pleasures. She said it, but she knew in a moment that she had used the wrong word, and was covered with confusion. Lorimer looked at her and laughed. And so do I, he said. Oh, if only I could unsay that, thought Idiala. But the word had gone forth, and was already garnered against her. Then came an awful moment for her. The moment of going in pain. It was hateful to let him pay for her lunch, but she could not help it. She was seized with one of those fits of shyness, which made it just a degree less painful to allow it than to make the effort to prevent it. They returned to Lorimer's room and pored together over a catalogue, looking up the books she wanted. When they had found their names and numbers, Lorimer sent for them from the library. But it was too late to do anything that day, and so she rose to go. Lorimer walked with her to the station and saw her into the train. On the way, they talked of little children. He loved them as she did. A friend of mine, he said, has the most beautiful child I ever saw. Just to look at it makes me feel a better man. End of chapter 17